So my name is Brendan. Today we're going to talk about principles of immunohistochemistry and get this slide going here. So um, this is a brief overview of the, uh, the protocol that you're going to be going through and what we're going to be talking about in each step. Uh, so we'll go through a little bit of the introduction of IHC, uh, talk about some sample treatment if, you're use, if you need to use that, the different specimen formats that you might be working with, fixation methods, uh, and processing tissue into paraffin wax, and then uh, different antigen retrieval steps if, if you need to, uh, to do that step, and then detection systems and the differences there, controls that you should use, how to use counter stains, and uh, finally, just specimen preparation for, an, for analysis. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about the difference between IHC, immunocytochemistry, immunofluorescence. A lot of those terms get thrown around, and, and um, I just want to make it clear here which, which is referring to which. So when you see IHC, this is immunohistochemistry, and histochemistry involves immunological detection of antigens on a tissue section, whereas if you see ICC, it's immunocytochemistry, and that is referring to immunological detection of antigens on cytological preparations, and these are cells. So both of these techniques use reporter labels to visualize the binding of the primary antibody to the antigen, uh, but this reporter label can be enzymatic or it can be fluorescent. Um, enzymatic reporter labels are only used for IHC. You never use enzymatic reporter labels in immunocytochemistry, whereas fluorescent reporter labels can be used for both ICC and IHC. So a lot of times the term immunofluorescence is thrown around and it's not clear what, whether that's on tissue sections or on, uh, on cells. And, and so if you're looking at an antibody and you're trying to get a protocol going, it's important to distinguish uh, which of those has been used on which. So when you say immunofluorescence, be sure it's either IT or ICC. And before you get started on uh, your research, there's a lot of factors to consider. So you need to consider the antigen that the antibody was raised against and where that epitope falls, where on the protein it falls, what isoform it's recognizing. Uh, you need to look at the sample type. So you want to make sure your protein of interest is actually expressed in that sample type you're working with. So this is where a positive control would be very useful. You want to look at the specimen format that's been used for this protein and the antibody you're working with, whether that's best used in paraffin embedded sections, frozen sections, or cytological preparations, et cetera. If you're looking at the antibody, you want to look at the species cross-reactivity of that antibody. And when you're looking at the protein, where that protein is going to be localized in the cell or on your tissue, so where do you expect it when you see your staining. You also want to look at the fixation technique that's best used with that antigen and antibody combination, and then whether antigen retrieval methods are required and what those antigen re retrieval methods require. Uh, finally, the antibody working concentrations and dilutions uh, that have been used before and the species that the antibody is raised in are also important factors to consider. So we're going to go through these today and in more detail. And this is just a basic uh, overflow of the workflow of your entire uh, process. So we're going to talk about sample treatment, sample preparation, and then immunostaining. So I just wanted to distinguish what these terms all mean. Sample treatment is your first step. You may or may not uh, in, use this step in your, in your uh, experiment. Then you'd move on to sample preparation and then your immunostaining protocol, and that would be IHC or ICC. Finally, your analysis, and then hopefully the end goal, which would be a publication. And I'm going to go through these in the, in the next few slides. So sample treatment, what does that mean? Uh, sample treatment refers to the modifying of the protein expression um, in your sample, so whether that's cells or whether that's within the animal in vivo. If you're working with cells, you may need to treat your cells with an appropriate inhibitor or activator to upregulate or downregulate a protein in the cell. If you're working in vivo, it's the same thing. You're going to upregulate or downregulate uh, that protein expression. But when you're working in vivo, there's a lot of factors to consider, of course, because it's a living animal. Uh, the potency of the inhibitor or the activator or agonist or antagonist, the selectivity of it. You don't want any downstream effects, you know, that are nonspecifically uh, causing some nonspecific uh, binding to whatever the protein is. 
Uh, you want to be sure that the cell uh, is permeabilized and, and that the, the chemical can actually penetrate through the cell or the blood-brain bar barrier if, if you're working in the brain. You want to be sure that the chemical you're working with is soluble in the solvent that you're going to be, that's close to the most in, vi most close to the in vivo state that you're working in. And also the route of administration, what's best for you, whether that's an injection or oral. And then finally, when that's all done, that's when you harvest the tissue for sample preparation. And sample preparation, this is a breakdown of what this is referring to. We refer to sample prep as the fixation of the tissue, the embedding of the tissue, sectioning, and then the antigen retrieval. From there, no matter what your, uh, your sample is, the immunostating protocol is pretty similar, where you use your blocking solution, you incubate with your primary, incubate with your secondary, adding the enzyme substrate if you're doing color metric detection, and then finally cover slipping and observing. So now I'm going to talk about the different specimen formats that you might be using. The most commonly used specimen format in immunohistochemistry is paraffin embedded tissue sections. And these are usually formal and fixed. Now the reason these are the most common is because they're the most, they have the most optimal balance between the preservation of the morphology of the tissue and the antigenicity of the protein. And the antigenicity of the protein is just defined as how well the antibody and the, and the protein will bind and stay bound to one another throughout the process. So paraffin embedded tissue sections are very stable and very easy to work with. Now there are always disadvantages to all these different formats, so I will mention those. It requires de-waxing before immunostaining, so it's a really it's a time consuming process and we're going to go into that in more detail. It does require antigen retrieval if it's fixed with a cross-linking reagent, which most of these are, so an aldehyde agent, and we're going to talk about the different fixation techniques in a bit. So that's an additional step on top of the de-waxing. Um, and typically these are only suitable for four micron thick sections. If the sections are any thicker than that, the antibody might get trapped and it might result in a false positive staining, which of course you don't want. Another common format is frozen tissue sections. Now these, when we say, when Abkim says immunohistochemistry with frozen sections, and we say this on our data sheet, this, require, this refers to non-aldehyde linked uh, fixation. So this is ideal for antigens that cannot withstand aldehyde fixation and paraffin processing. Uh, so these antigens tend to be in a more native state. Now the disadvantage to these is that the morphology of the tissue can be poor because it's not fixed with an aldehyde. So compared to paraffin, it's, it just might not look as nice. Uh, it's technically more challenging because of this. And the samples because this as well are more fragile. So antigen retrieval is more risky and you don't want to do that. Again, these are typically used for very thin sections of so 4 to 10 microns. And again, any thicker sections may trap the antibody, resulting in false positive staining. So if you're working with a type of tissue that you cannot section that thin, this is when you want to consider uh, free-floating tissue sections. And this is, tends to be with brain tissue and spinal cord and, and developmental research, this is all really useful. It's a useful technique. Because these can be used for thicker sections up to 40 microns. Uh, the disadvantage is it's a bit more awkward to work with because, as the name implies, you're not mounting these till the very end. These are going to be free floating throughout the entire process. You use a lot of uh, solution and then at the end you have to mount them on the glass microscope side and that can be difficult. And the other thing is, a lot of times, especially if you're working with neuroscience, the animal does get perfused with PFA, um, and then that is obviously a very more challenging step, too. So each of these have their advantages and disadvantages, but it depends, you know, what works best for you. And finally, I, I just wanted to mention what cytological preparations are, because we talked about that a bit earlier. Uh, these are commonly in the form of conventional smears. Um, you might see this referred to as thin prep monolayers on a microscope slide. And you can think of this as taking an endothelial smear, like a cheek swab, and putting it on a slide. Or these are also, cytological preparations are also cell lines that are grown on chamber slides, glass cover slips, or 96-well imaging plates. 
Again, use the most appropriate format for your experiment in terms of both the practicality and the antigenicity and how well that will bind to the antibody and the protein will bind to one another.